Hello and uh, welcome once again to our video lecture. This is Lourdes Rudio and for this video we're going to talk about a poetry from this time it's going to be a representative text of Africa and the title of our poetry is Telephone Conversation. So in this discussion we're going to talk about of course um, our featured poet, Wole Suyinka, uh, the different elements and the different devices that we could use in interpreting and understanding telephone conversation on a deeper level. Because I understand some of you have uh, already discussed this in your senior high school. But then let's add a bit more uh, depth on our understanding of this very famous poetry, Telephone Conversation. So. Let's get started. So in this discussion, uh, there are four things that we'd like to talk about. First is the poem. We're going to read it. And then a little bit about the poet. And then, of course, the very, uh, shall we say, the very obvious issue or... Uh, topic of this poem and then later on we're going to talk about some other things that would help us understand this poem on a deeper level as i've said so let's first take a look at telephone conversation the price seemed reasonable location indifferent the landlady swore she lived off premises Nothing remained but self-confession. Madam, I warned, I hate a wasted journey. I am African. Silence. Silence transmission of pressurized good breeding. Voice when it came. Lipstick coated, long gold rolled, cigarette holder piped. Caught I was foully. How dark. I had not misheard. Are you light or very dark? Button B, button A. Stench of rancid breath of public hide and speak. Red booth, red pillar box, red double tiered omnibus squelching tar. It was real. Shamed by ill mannered silence, surrender. Push dumbfounded to beg simplification. Considerate she was, varying the emphasis, are you dark or very light? Revelation came. You mean like plain or milk chocolate? Her ascent was clinical, crushing in its light impersonality. Rapidly, wavelength adjusted, I chose West African sepia. And as afterthought, down in my passport, silence for a spectroscopic flight of fancy, till truthfulness clanged her accent, hard on the mouthpiece. What's that? Conceding. Don't know what that is. Like brunette. That's dark, isn't it? Not altogether. Facially, I am brunette. But madam, you should see the rest of me. Palm of my hand, soles of my feet are a peroxide blonde. Friction cost, foolishly, madam, by sitting down, has turned my bottom raven black. One moment, madam, sensing her receiver rearing on the thunderclap about my ears. Madam, I pleaded, wouldn't you rather see for yourself? So that was a telephone conversation. Now, uh, probably your first observation is that unlike uh, Sonnet 116 and Tiny Feet, this somehow uses a simpler idea, a simpler language. It seems like it's using simple language. So I bet that somehow you already have an idea of what this poetry is all about. But then later, I want us to focus on the different, uh, not really nuances, but uh, the peculiarities of this poetry. Because take note, 
that it is poetry, but um, somehow it defies the the standards, the conventions of a poetry, and we will talk about that later on. So now let us proceed with the. So now let us proceed with the poet. Our featured poet for this uh, literary piece is Wole Suyinka. He's from West Africa. Um, just a short biography of Suyinka. I should say that his life actually revolves around or between uh, Africa and the UK because most of the uh, important events that happen in his life occurred in either Africa or the UK. So he was born on July 13, 1934, in a small village uh, in Abikuta near Ibadan in Western Africa. And that's where he finished his education. And when he was ready to uh, take on university, that's the time that he went to uh, the UK. He gained his bachelor's degree in the University of Leeds. And while he was there, he became a member of a theater group. And in fact, in 1960, he was awarded the Rockefeller Bursary. When we say uh, bursary, it is a scholarship to study drama or theater. So he was awarded that, but instead what he did, instead of pursuing uh, further studies in the UK, he actually went back to Africa to study African drama. One of his actions got somehow misunderstood or misinterpreted by the African government that when he called for a ceasefire during the African Civil War, he was mistaken to be uh, a part of the rebel. And therefore, he was taken as a political prisoner. If I'm not mistaken, it, w it was him who uh, <laughs> who actually um, went to a local radio station and did a broadcast of his plea for ceasefire. And that action, again, brought him to jail for two years as a political prisoner. During his stay in the prison, he was um, he was able to come up with some of his literary works while in prison. After that, in 1973, he went back to London to pursue to, to pursue his doctorate degree, also in the same university. And then, after he finished that, he went back to Africa once again to teach drama and literature as well as comparative literature. So we can say that Soyinka really has this sense of uh, patriotism because after gaining his education in a foreign land, he would constantly go back to his um, native land so that he could educate his fellow countrymen. So that's a very short, um, well, actually, it's just a gist, the gist of his uh, life of Wuli Suyinka. So uh, Wuli Suyinka's real name is this. It's, uh, well, I don't know which one is longer, the real name of Gabriela Mistral or Wuli Suyinka's uh, name. Akinwande Oluwule Babatunde Suyinka. But he is uh, well known as simply Wuli Suyinka. All in all, he had 20 literary works, combination of novels, drama, and poetry. But his work is characterized by the way, by his use of language. He had, he has a way with language. So uh, it's quite ironic no? because as I've told you earlier, it seems that telephone conversation uses um, simple words. But uh, we will see later, okay? And of course, in 1996, he got the, shall we say, the highest award in, in, in literature, which was the Nobel Prize in Literature. So, as I've told you at the very beginning of our uh, class, that 
uh, a number of the writers that we're going to discuss are actually Nobel Prize awardees. So Soyinka was one of them. Now, uh, whenever we discuss Soyinka, we cannot really help but also discuss a movement, a political and also a literary movement called Negritude Movement. So to simply put it, because I assume that you've already read the, the links and the references that I have uh, included in our module, when we say Negritude, it's a celebrating, it's a way of celebrating everything African, African culture, African literature, and everything about them. And uh, Leopold Senghor was the one who was, well, he, he, he was said to be the one to establish Negritude uh, movement or Negritude literature. However, some literature would say that even though Soyinka's works are considered to be part of Negritude literature or they, they represent Negritude literature, Wuri Soyinka is also known to be uh, not really a non-supporter, but he contradicts negritude literature or negritude movement, all in all. Because for him, this kind of thinking, for him, he considers it to be something that came from the colonial idea. So if it's colonial idea, it just affirms that um, Africans are inferior to the Western people. And Negritude literature or Negritude movement gives them a defensive uh, nature. So instead of, for Soyinka, instead of doing that, they should not dwell on the past, but instead learn something from the past and then use it to better their future. So that's that's the relationship between uh, Negritude and Wuli Soyinka. Okay. Let's now talk about the issue that is prevalent in telephone conversation. Just by uh, one reading it once would actually give you an idea that this could be about racism because you know it's it's all over. There are two people, you know, having a conversation over the phone. The one said admits confess, that's, that's, that, that's the word, that he is African. And then after knowing that, the other person on the line, the landlady, started to make their conversation not about the other person on the line trying to rent a place or an apartment, but the landlady made their conversation about his race, his color particularly. So, racism is considered to be a crime because it says here that it is um, making one's race to be the determining factor of your capabilities, of your talents, of everything that you are able to do. And therefore, there are races that are inferior to other races. Okay? So, how do we... How do we come about the idea that telephone conversation is about racism? Let's take a look. So in this part of the poem, we could see the persona narrating something. What is so, um, what is so not really peculiar, but something that worth noting is how, how the whole poem is formed you know if you if you take a look at it it actually looks like a telephone booth you know i don't know if you're still familiar with telephone booths but once upon a time <laughs> you know people could make phone calls in public places you know there are booths and there are booths and then there are phones inside that you have to um put on some coins for it to work and then you dial and then that's it it actually looks like that now what made this what what about the words here because Wole Soyinka is known to be very good with words 
So let us now pinpoint those things that made us think that this is about racism. So the first part, the price seemed reasonable, location indifferent. The landlady swore she lived off-premises. So in the first two sentences, we get the idea that the persona is, uh, is looking for a place to stay, or an apartment perhaps. And so he said the price seemed reasonable. So the price was, was just good for him. The location indifferent. What do we mean by indifferent again? You don't care. Okay, nobody cares. Why did he say or why did the persona say it's indifferent? The landlady swore she lived off premises. So first of all, the landlady is not somewhere near the apartment. And therefore, the persona thinks that, you know, he's more free to do whatever he feels like doing. Okay. And the location is indifferent, meaning the community doesn't seem to care about whatever's happening with their neighbors. So it seems like all of these things made him decide to call the landlady because he was actually considering to rent that apartment or that house. Nothing remained but self-confession. Self-confession. Kumbaga, he couldn't ask for more. This is a very, um, very positive thing for him. And therefore, he felt like he needed to confess. What is it that he needed to confess? He said, Madam, I warned. My question now is, when do you confess? Isn't it that when you do something, that when you have done something... That's not right? That you have committed a crime? That's when you confess, right? That's when you warn. You are going to warn somebody because something bad might happen. The question is, why do you have to confess your race? Is there something bad about being an African that you need to confess and you need to warn somebody about? So that in itself gave us an idea that this is about issues of race. But we could also notice that it's the persona who is actually uh, somehow <laughs> thinking of discriminating himself because he's trying to warn the landlady that he is African. So that's something unusual, right? Usually... We are proud of our race, especially Filipinos. Like, everywhere we go, we, we are proud to say that we are Filipinos. But this persona here felt like he needed to confess that he is African. So what happened after he confessed? There was silence. Silence, transmission of pressurized good breeding. Pressurized good breeding. Have you ever heard of that term? When do you put something in the pressure cooker? Or why do you put something or cook something using a pressure cooker? Because you want to make it tender. Because it's naturally hard, you want to make it soft. Pinilit. Ano yung pinilit? Good breeding. Meaning, he is... Um, insinuating that the landlady is not naturally nice, but it's like she felt like she needed to be nice to the persona. Voice when it came, lipstick coated, long gold rolled cigarette holder pipe. Notice how he, he used visual imagery to describe an auditory element. He was trying to describe the voice of the landlady. But what he used here are all visual imagery. Lipstick coated, long gold rolled cigarette holder piped. That's the sound of the landlady's voice. Caught I was foully. 
How dark? I had not misheard. Are you light or very dark? Button B, button A, stench of rancid breath of public hide and speak. Notice that since this is telephone conversation, we expect that one person would speak and then the other one would also speak because they're having conversation. But notice how the African's dialogue is presented here. And notice how the landlady's dialogues or lines are presented here. So you have the first dialogue of the African tenant. Madam, I warned, I hate a wasted journey. I am African. Now, let's take a look at the lines of the landlady. How dark? Are you light or very dark? What do you notice? Very obviously, the African's dialogues are presented in sentence case. But the dialogue of the landlady is presented in all capital letters. And when you present something in all capital letter, you seem to notice immediately the things that are written in all capital letters, right? And therefore, they are highlighted. And in that case, somehow we could see that there's discrimination between the two characters here. That the landlady's dialogues are more emphasized, highlighted, than the dialogue of the persona, of the African persona. So, structurally speaking, there's also discrimination here. But take note, what is the concern of the African caller? It's all about the place that he wants to rent. Yet, the, the, the landlady is here instead of, instead of uh, asking about his work, his capacity to pay the rent, it seemed like the most important thing for her now is to know if the African tenant is light or very dark. When you are the one, when you are the African tenant, you you would really, it's, it's quite unexpected. And so how did the persona react after hearing that? He said, button B, button A stench of rancid breath of public hide and speak button b button a and the asterisk there are all buttons on the telephone okay the dials so it's like saying that he after hearing that he checked his surroundings he checked his surroundings he saw the buttons on the phone. He smelled the bad smell of the mouthpiece. Okay, that's a rancid breath of public hide and speak. And then he started seeing the red booth. The red booth, that's the telephone booth. The red pillar box, that's the phone because they are usually red. And then when he looked outside, he also see the red double-tiered omnibus. Those are the double-decker, the double-deck buses. And where are they usually found? Where in the world are all of these things found? You have the red double-decker buses, you have the red telephone, and you also have the red telephone booth in London. London, somehow, the red bus, the red double-tier uh, omnibus, and the red telephone booth are, they have now become like icons of London. And London is the center of uh, development of England, of UK. And after hearing all of these and seeing all of these things, he said to himself, it was real. It's like, did I just hear that correctly? And then he checked his surroundings. 
And after seeing all of these things and smelling the bad smell of the mouthpiece, he said, yeah, I think she just asked me about my color. Okay? But we have already clues actually here of how the African persona was feeling. Words are repeated here. What are they? Red double-tiered omnibus, red booth, red pillar box. Three times the color red is repeated. Red, aside from love, <laughs> red also symbolizes anger. He was already angry because he didn't expect that the, the, the uh, landlady <laughs> made their conversation about his color instead of him renting her place. But after he realized that it was real and he was angry, he said, shamed by ill-mannered silence, was he able to say something? No, he remained silent. And for other cultures, because in the Philippines, when we're silent, we're being respectful. But in other cultures, silence is being disrespectful. He was being he was asked something. And when he did not speak, he felt like he was being disrespectful. Now you see there, he felt angry, but at the same time, he wasn't able to say something. And yet he felt like he was the one being ill-mannered, rude. So when he did not say anything, what did the landlady say? Consider it she was, varying the emphasis. Are you dark or very light? Revelation came. Like here. The first question here was, how dark? Are you light or very dark? Now when he didn't say anything, the landlady was considerate enough to change the emphasis. Instead of asking, are you light or very dark? She said, are you dark or very light? So it's funny how the, the African persona thinks of the landlady as considerate because she changed the emphasis in her questioning. And then he finally answered. But instead of answering, he asked her a question or the persona asked her a question. You mean like plain or milk chocolate? Her ascent was clinical, crushing in its light impersonality. Rapidly, wavelength adjusted, I chose. West African sepia. And as afterthought, down in my passport. When she changed her emphasis, the persona is now able to answer. And he said, and he asked, you mean like plain or milk chocolate? He now compares himself to an object, a chocolate. Because when you say plain, that's dark. But if it's milk chocolate, it's kind of light. And then suddenly, he said, West African sepia. That's the color of his skin. And if you check West African sepia, it's very dark to the point that it it somehow resembles dark green color, very dark green color. And then he added, down in my passport, because that's what's indicated in his passport. Now it's the landlady's turn to be silent. Silence for spectroscopic flight of fancy. There's the use of alliteration. Alliteration is using the same sound in consecutive words. So you have silence, spectroscopic, the sound of the letter S, and flight of fancy. So silence for spectroscopic flight of fancy till truthfulness clanged her accent hard on the mouthpiece. It seems like because when you pronounce silence for spectroscopic flight of fancy, it's like a tongue twister. So it also represents <laughs> the the mind now of the landlady that she couldn't, it, it seems like she was so confused, she couldn't figure out what West African sepia looks like. And therefore, it was now her turn again to ask, what's that conceding? Don't know what that is. So she doesn't know what West African sepia looks like. And then the persona answered again, 
like brunette. That's dark, isn't it? This conversation did not end well because the landlady actually hung up. Hang up. And the last part of the dialogue of the African persona was no longer heard by the uh, landlady, who we could imagine is from London, therefore she's white. Okay. Now, looking at this, looking at this um, poetry, truthfully, we could say that racism is all over it. Okay, there's no question about it. Some people, some of my former students would usually feel sorry for the African tenant. And they feel mad toward the, the landlady, which is a natural reaction. But then later, when we take a look at this um, poetry on a different angle, using different uh, devices, we could see so much more in it. More than it being about simply being about racism. So let's move on. One thing that I would like to talk about is irony. I don't know if you would agree with me this early when I say that this poetry is full of irony. This is a very ironic poetry. And then later on, we will discover and I will explain how this poem is a very, very funny poetry. Irony. So what is irony? Based on the links that I have provided with you, uh, for you, uh, we have verbal, dramatic, and situational irony. Verbal relies on the use of language. The person says something, but he was actually meaning the opposite of it. That's verbal. Dramatic, the audience knows what's happening, while the characters do not know what's happening. Probably you're thinking that a uh, telephone conversation employs dramatic irony. Probably yes, because you already know that that he was being discriminated. It seems like it just seems like he was the one who doesn't know it yet. And then you also have situational irony. The expectation is totally different from what is uh, given to us in reality. One subtype of situational irony is called structural irony. Structural irony is characterized by, by its naive persona or character or narrator. Between dramatic and situational or structural irony, I would say the telephone conversation is uh, structurally ironic because of the fact that the persona is a naive persona. He even confessed of being an African as if it's something bad, as if, as if he has done something bad by just being an African guy. But then this... this Poetry has a twist in it. But moving on, I always discuss and I always uh, ask my students to listen to the song Ironic by Alanis Morissette. You weren't born when this was famous, but I'm sure that when you've heard of it, it will sound familiar. The first uh, stanza says, An old man turned 98, don't ask me to sing. He won the lottery and died the next day. It's a black fly in your Chardonnay, pardon me with a typo. It's a death row pardon two minutes too late. And isn't it ironic? Don't you think? These are situational irony. And the chorus would say, it's like a rain on your wedding day because wedding day is supposed to be happy. Rain represents loneliness or sadness. It's a free ride when you're already paid or when you've already paid. 
So after you've paid, it's already now a free ride for you. It's a good advice that you just didn't take. And who would have thought it figured? Okay, those are situational irony. And if you have time, because I cannot upload the whole song here, if you have time, you can you can listen to this uh, classic song of Alanis Morissette. Now, I want us to the comedy. I don't know again if you if you will agree that this is a very very funny poetry. If you felt sorry for the persona, it's okay, but you shouldn't be. I mean, the persona might just be laughing at you for being sorry for him. Okay, this is a very funny, very witty poetry. And we go back again to the very prominent characteristic of Wally Suyinka's work that he that it is rich in language. He has a way in the use of language. So, once again, the first part. The naivety. The characters being naive is already seen in this part. When he felt like it was his responsibility to confess his being African. And then, I want us to jump right into this part right here when the landlady started to ask about his color. And he now started to get angry, right? The red booth, red pillar box, red double-tiered omnibus, squelching tar. And he realized that, hey, I'm now the subject of discrimination, of racism in this conversation. And his silence, it wasn't seen. He actually used his silence against the discrimination of the landlady. He didn't answer so that the landlady will now be forced to say something again. Okay? But then, in first reading, we, we think of it as, oh, nakakaawa naman siya. We feel sorry for him because he was shocked. He couldn't say anything. And he won. <laughs> because the landlady, again, varied her emphasis. And she now asked, are you dark or very light? And then, he said, you mean like plain or milk chocolate? Okay. If we take a look at racism per se, and we see here the persona objectifying himself, meaning comparing himself to an object, a chocolate, that is one way of discriminating something or someone, sorry. And therefore, we could say here that he was the one discriminating himself too because he was objectifying himself. Because instead of explaining how, how his skin looks like, he compared himself to chocolate. But let us establish now that this African guy didn't come to London because he was a slave or whatever. This African guy could be a well-educated guy. That's why he needed to rent a place for him to stay probably while he's studying or probably while he's working as a professor. We do not know. And his use of an object to compare himself to was actually an insult to the landlady. Why? Because he thought that when I explained to her my color, she wouldn't understand it. And therefore, he just used simple words, simple terms, simple references like chocolate because he was thinking that that's the kind of vocabulary the landlady could understand. So when the landlady could not choose between plain and milk chocolate, he had no choice but to say West African sepia down in my passport. West African sepia. And after he said that, the landlady now confessed <laughs> that she actually did not know what African sepia looks like. And then again, the African persona used a simpler word 
so that the other the the landlady could understand him he said like brunette because it's like blonde and brunette are the only colors that the landlady <laughs> could understand probably she was blonde or she colored her hair blonde but it's naturally brunette so it's like the the african guy is saying that these are the kind of vocabulary such a poor vocabulary the landlady has that she could only understand brunette blonde perhaps dark and light you see how how simple the words of the landlady are light dark very light very dark okay but the african guy he even used metaphor or simile when he compared his skin to chocolate. And then the landlady asked, that's dark, isn't it? That's when she, she just realized how dark it is. Brunette, the African guy, responded again, not altogether. Facially, I am brunette, but madam, you should see the rest of me. So in this part, if we just take a look at racism, it's like, we feel sorry again for the persona because he is explaining, you know, he's explaining to the landlady how he looks like and that it's as if he's trying to convince the landlady to treat him very well or to treat him fairly. And then suddenly she hung up and he could not finish his explanation. But take, let's take a look at it this way. When he started explaining... You should see the rest of me. Inviting someone to check you out. Palm of my hand, soles of my feet are a peroxide blonde. You see, again, those are just those are the simple vocabularies that the landlady could understand. Blonde, peroxide blonde. When we say peroxide blonde, it's compared to a color of uh, to a blonde that is you know you know you bleach it. That's it. Peroxide blonde. That's bleached. Friction caused foolishly, madam, by sitting down has turned my bottom raven black. Now he's talking about his butt. And of course, the landlady thought that it was improper of him to talk about his butt because she is a fine young London girl or London lady. One moment, madam, because this time, the landlady already hung up. Madam, I pleaded, wouldn't you rather see for yourself? Now, even though the landlady was no longer listening, it's like, you know, uh, inviting her to actually see for herself. It's either see for herself the rest of his body or see for herself how black his butt is. So in this poetry, uh, it began with the thinking that it's just purely about racism. Yes, it is about racism. But what I want us to realize is that the twist in it, how racism was treated in this poetry by Wole Soyinka with the use of structural irony with the use of a very naive at first uh, we thought that he was naive but he actually was a very intelligent african guy persona with the way he used his vocabulary against the landlady so looking at it we could see that at the beginning the conversation was you know, um, it has a business tone because the, the African guy was just asking about this place that he could rent. Unfortunately, the conversation suddenly turned into or it has now become about his skin color, not anymore about his renting the place. And at first, we feel sorry. Because we could see how the persona got mad, but he couldn't say anything to the landlady. But 
through the African persona's wit, his use of words, his intelligence, their position, because at the beginning, the, the landlady was trying to establish that she was superior over the African guy. Because she could shift, she could change the topic of their conversation from business to being about his race and his skin color. So, here's the landlady, here's the African guy who is being discriminated because of his race. But as the poetry goes on, their position actually changed. That at the end, if it was a battle of wit, the African guy, the African persona actually won over the landlady because she did not succeed in discriminating the African persona that instead of him being offended by her, at the end, it was him who actually offended the landlady. Uh, there's a binary opposite presented in this poetry because there are two personas and they are totally different. One is white, the other is black. One is a girl, the other is, you know, we assume that he's a guy. One is supposed to be educated, the other is assumed to be uneducated, the African guy. But then, at the towards the end, the typical perception between these two binary opposites were actually changed. It was wrecked. There was deconstruction that happened. Deconstruction is changing the typical views that people have about things. You know, when you see uh, the expectation also is not met. Because when we realize that here's an African guy and here's a white landlady, the expectation is the African guy will be discriminated by this landlady. That's what we expected. And for some of us, that's what we believe telephone conversation is all about. But if we take a look at the structure and the use of um, irony in telephone conversation, we see that that position shifted. That our expectation was not met. In fact, it was the opposite of what we expected. Somehow, that's what we mean by deconstruction. And that is how we understand telephone conversation. We don't stop from racism, but we appreciate how the persona was able to triumph over the supposed discrimination. So, once again, I hope uh, you have learned something from this video lecture. If you like my videos, please uh, don't hesitate to comment or subscribe. Okay, 